TV Club. Our next program this morning begins in two minutes. This is the Open University. Hello and welcome back to this uh, University of the Air, of the Tube. Um, it's funny, YouTube seems to be um, collapsing a little bit into a kind of capitalist um, uh, sinkhole because uh, in a way the same thing that, that was happening with blogging at the end of uh, my blogging life at about 2010 is happening now to YouTube as well, which is that um, commercial interests move in, advertising now invading every free inch and free moment. So uh, <clears throat> it seems like there's less content made by people who are not corporate now. Uh, it's, it's a constant battle and as you, as you go through life and you get older and you see how these things happen, you see continuous waves of apparent liberty uh, in which uh, rather than consolidating that liberty, the, the forces um, seeming to enable it suddenly turn against it and start to um, to profit from it, <coughs> which is, the, of course, the way of capitalism. As you can hear, I had a bit of a cold last week. Um, I'm, just, I'm still a bit phlegmy, but I'm over it. I'm back in Berlin, but I'm questioning how long uh, I'm going to stay here. I think probably Paris is a more natural destination for me because my girlfriend lives in Paris and... Um, I suppose I'm thinking about identity and uh, place, that relationship between identity and place. Who is the me who lives in Japan? If you look back a couple of years in these uh, these videos, I'm in Japan and I'm, you know, sitting on the floor asking myself, am I tatamize? Am I actually tatamized by my experience of living as an expat um, or an economic migrant or whatever you want to call it in Japan? Uh, and then I'm in, you know in Athens for eight months and, uh, you know, the, I always find that very liberating. <clears throat> Just when I'm uh, established somewhere and I seem to have my habits around me. It was, the interesting thing about coming back to this flat actually was forgetting how, how lights switched on or, or where I kept scissors. You know, this, is, this flat is a kind of little ecosystem which is very well designed for me to have my things around me. I've actually got things which have been in storage for years around me for a change, um, which has its plus and its negative sides because I'm reminded of how old I am, how long I've been around, how long I've been, you know, collecting old paperbacks and sweaters and things like that. I've got them all here. One thing I've been doing in the last week or so has been throwing out old CDs, the CDs that are landfill indie, if you like, um, putting them literally into a landfill or putting them into the trash to go to a landfill. Because I really, um, you know, I've been carrying these things around and they become a sort of weight penalty. Uh, things that people just casually gave me in 1996 or something at some concert saying, here's my demo. Um, finally, in 2021, it goes into a landfill. Sorry, guys, but I, I can't keep dragging things around. Or things which, you know, I've lived often with flatmates who have then abandoned their possessions and gone back to New Zealand or wherever they came from or Japan. Uh, and left me their records, their CDs, you know, their clothes in some cases. Um, so periodically I've had to um, <clears throat> adopt parts of other people's identity. So, you know, I've got a mixture and sometimes now I look at a book, I have a lot of books by Céline, for instance. I've never read Céline. Um, and I remember, oh yeah, that's because I lived with Vicky, who uh, was dating Lawrence, and Lawrence was into Céline, and so she bought all these Céline books. And... I, st I haven't read them, but I've got them here on my shelves. So I have to think, is that something I was into at a particular point? And then, no, but I don't have any memory of having read Celine, so it can't be my book. So I have to um, disentangle what I have here um, from the people who I lived with and whose identity I was sort of sharing at that time. I don't know to, to what extent I've been Athensized by eight months in Athens. Um, I, I do like the idea of continuing to exist in this way in different cities for short periods, rather than having roots in one particular place. I'm, I'm, a, 
an anywhere rather than a somewhere person, and I'm going to continue to be that kind of person. I don't feel any particular loyalty or connection to Germany, and I'm quite happy with the idea of leaving Germany uh, very shortly. And um, But of course it's been part of my identity, um, and uh, I've been attuned to Berlin, ironically, uh, paradoxically, as a place where people who have no place tend to congregate. In other words, artists and people who don't really feel they belong where they come from, inverted commas, uh, can congregate here. And it's, there has been a history of it being a kind of free zone when it wasn't you know, being run by Hitler. Uh, it, it was a sort of free zone for misfits, and uh, that's obviously something that appeals to me. Um, I've been... Um, taking advantage of the fact that it is the capital of a rich country and therefore I could get, for instance, mRNA jabs, vaccines against the ye, uh, ye COVID. Ooh, the plaster's actually come off my COVID wound. I, I got a COVID injection, the vaccination on, uh, I think it was Tuesday? Tuesday. Which was fine, didn't have any side effects um, from that, and it, it, the needle went in like melted butter. Uh, no pain at all. Um, and... Um, just a slight muscular ache from, you know, because it's an intramuscular injection. And I'll have my second uh, in August for that. But um, Britain has just declared that it's not accepting double vaccinated um, people from Europe, um, especially from France right now, uh, or from Germany. I think we have to, we would have to quarantine, even with two vaccinations we would have to quarantine if we decided to go back to Britain, which is ironic because Germany has currently... Uh, a tiny, tiny fraction of the COVID cases that Britain has. Britain is going for a kind of let the corpses pile high approach, uh, herd immunity approach, and Germany is still relatively spared the Delta um, influx, the variant. So um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm sort of benefiting from the fact that this is a rich country and that um, we do, thank goodness, have access to, to this, this amazing technology of mRNA. Um, so, I guess, you know, it is a have a cake and eat it kind of approach, but um, <clears throat> I think probably France makes more sense for me in future. So, uh, what else have I been thinking and doing? I, I've, yeah, I've been feeling um, <clears throat> that strange mixed blessing of having your stuff around you, because, because it's, it's nice to define who you are and to have defined who you are. And to reach back and <clears throat> you know be able to um, to play we with the old me, <clears throat> the old identities I made for my friends uh, when I set up my we machine, for instance. Uh, you know I can sort of get a certain satisfaction from playing tennis with uh, with those people <laughs> with their avatars, um, or play, or having my real accordion, which um, I had to substitute in Greece with a wheezy little child's accordion, which nevertheless made a very interesting sound, I think. On, on tracks like um, Chattanooga. But uh, I'm back here with a lot of equipment, um, trying to digitize old DV tapes of, you know, interviews I made with my father and that kind of thing uh, to, to send files to my family, but um, unable to, uh, to make the, the, the technologies connect because, of course, with computer technology, you're constantly on a, a curve of uh, updating to the new operating system. Whereas that DV technology is stuck in the 90s, and I think it was 1995 they agreed on that standard. Um, I had my first DV camera, a JVC, uh, in 1996, and it seemed like this was an, a full AVIGS format, a forever format, that you would never have to, uh, because it was digital, you'd never have to have any problems, you know, accessing that material. But now my old DV camera camcorder doesn't play back the sound properly, I can't even make sound audio only recordings out of it. I've also got a whole bunch of tapes in video 8 format from before 1995 and um, so that whole parts of my past which <clears throat> in theory this, this flat is, is for me to have access to my past. This is where I have my archive, <laughs> my stuff, my papers which if I were a famous author I'd sell my papers to some university library or something that'd be <laughs> getting to that point where you make a cool million by selling your papers. I don't think I'm really that notable, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, in, in theory, um, if it's on paper, that's fine. But uh, the, the more intermediate formats where I switch to video and things like that is fairly useless. I, I don't even know where you could buy a 
a DV camcorder now just to, just to replace the broken camcorder I have. So it's really becoming very rapidly accessible. There's this phenomenon by which the recent past, because it was much more technological, is much more inaccessible. It's oblivion, like a sinkhole, like the flooding sinkholes that have opened up in Western Germany in the last week or so. You have this kind of technological sinkhole of uh, recent formats, the dead formats society, as I call it sometimes, whereby your past, precisely because it was promised to you as a for evix uh, format, a, w a way of preserving things forever, it's actually um, it was actually the opposite. It was a very um, volatile and um, transitory way to preserve things. The digital media of the 90s. Uh, I think in theory it should all be zeros and ones on the tape and there would, should be some way to resurrect it, but uh, um, it's not easy, as I'm discovering. And, um, <clears throat> you know, even the cables don't exist. Uh, they used to use firewire cables to take um, digital signal out of those cameras and uh, you now have to make some daisy chain of cables between firewire, USB, previous USB, current USB-C, and then you find that the um, Catalina... OS Mac system doesn't actually even support um, that, those connections anymore and you can't get that dig digital information onto your current computer. If you have an old computer lying around, I've got a few dead computers here, um, perhaps you could resurrect one of those and then put in, etc, etc. So <clears throat> it's kind of an endlessly fusty and dusty kind of um, a quest to uh, update relevant information or irrelevant information. And of course, every time you go down one of those rabbit holes, you know, I was just looking at um, videos of uh, Japan trips in, you know, 1997, 98, whatever. It kind of reminds you, God, did I really dress like that? And I thought I dressed well at the time, you know, <laughs> or did I, was I really dating that person? And, you know, where's that person ended up? That person is now 20 years older, and they must be married and have children. and. I don't know, it's a kind of, it is, it's a melancholy process and um, having just uh, published last year my, my autobiography, I, I kind of feel like I've, I've offloaded all that data and I don't really need to look at it anymore. I've put it in an old paper <laughs> medium format but made sure it was sort of um, shunted off to somewhere fairly inaccessible, somewhere fairly niche. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, although I'm thinking I would love to, to see my future happening in a variety of places, but probably, you know, between France and, say, between Paris and Seoul. Those are two cities that I, I find very um, interesting. There is a kind of um, a sense, having come back from a city like Athens to a city like Berlin, of things being, well, simultaneously, it's very advanced. Like, I can go to an exhibition, like I went to a big um, exhibition of education, in the 60s and 70s in the Haus der Kultur und der Welt, which is an institution I feel very close to, you know, ethically, ideologically, aesthetically, uh, here in Berlin. Um, I wouldn't find an exhibition as um, pleasant as that. I went with my friend Jan. Again, me and Jan, our values are very similar, although he lives now in the countryside, and ironically, he's had to buy a car to get to and from his, uh, you know, between his work and his home in the countryside, because there's no public transport. Um, he's we always been very post-materialist and we've um, had a kind of post-materialist ethical kind of club, Jan and me, but um, he's had to, had to buy a car, which in, in some ways is like um, selling your soul to the enemy, but it is the price you have to pay for rural living. I, I could never really live in the countryside. It's too rooted, although weirdly enough, places like Gersvalde, where he lives, have become very cosmopolitan and there are artists and people from all over the world living there kind of people, the overspill from Berlin in a sense, but it's, it's a very affluent overspill. Often there are people, famous people like Wim Wenders are living now in these little Uckermark villages around Berlin, or at least have a, a second home in places like that and go there at the weekend. But yeah, there's, 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 Berlin has this, the thing I was always complaining about in Athens was the carbon culture and the fact that people were revving motorbikes, which they'd had adjusted to make more noise. There's this combination of toxic masculinity and carbon culture, which uh, seems to get worse as you go more further south uh, towards the equator. <laughs> there seem to be more, there's less kind of concern, for, you know, less restriction on people who want to make a lot of noise just for the hell of it. 
Um, so here in Berlin, suddenly I'm back amongst people with electric scooters. and I mean, they did exist in Athens, there were some of those, but uh, here you get much more of a sense of, you know, the bicycles and the uh, electric scooters and the new mobility solutions like electric bicycles, something I've been renting a lot since getting here because my bike has a flat or the bike I have the use of. I don't actually have my own bike here. An artist uh, leaving Berlin uh, gave me the use of his bike. But it's got a flat just now, so I'm renting these Lime um, bicycles, which are electric. So you get a lot of uh, zing in the uh, the push on the pedals. And when you're out there on the roads, uh, there are whole areas of Berlin which belong to pedestrians, cyclists, uh, electric scooter riders, non-electric scooter riders. And you get a sense of a, a kind of Scandinavian, utopian feeling of... Um, uh, this is the future. This is the future of urban mobility. It's young people on kind of these various new forms of electric uh, gadget, which of course are not that new because you did have electric scooters a century ago. They just never caught on. And it's now the time for them to catch on because we need a post, um, a post carbon uh, ecosphere, <laughs> urban infrastructure, which is post carbon. And um, so, of course, that. That aligns absolutely with my way of thinking about, about how to get around and how a city should be. It could be going even faster. I think Paris is actually ahead of Berlin in that sense, that um, the 15-minute city, and Hidalgo, who's now launching a bid for the presidency of France, who's been Paris mayor, a very great mayor, in terms of reorganizing Paris better, banning uh, carbon traffic. Of course, we have these bans on on carbon cars being sold within you know five years in some cases ten years fifteen years twenty years even starting to get a bit um, too slow but I think people especially with the the eco chaos which has come with the recent flooding this week in Germany it's focused people's minds very much on climate change the shocking news that the uh, the rainforest in Brazil is now actually emitting more carbon than it's absorbing it's become a, a huge burning site because of Logging concerns and other commercial concerns. It's a bit like the, like YouTube and uh, blogging. You know, capitalism tends to destroy everything it touches. Eventually, it comes in. You know, waving green credentials, greenwashing the hell out of things, and then um, shows its true face eventually and starts uh, destroying things. So it needs to be heavily, heavily regulated. I'm a great fan of. I mean, one reason I love Asian cities like Tokyo and Seoul is precisely because. They do capitalism in a way that's that's much more uh, that's more responsible and more toned down and more um, mature. It's a more mature capitalism, which goes hand in hand with their more mature civic sense. How to live in high density situations without annoying other people, uh, being considerate, being self abnegating uh, rather than self asserting. Britain just now went to an absolute chaos of self assertion following the Euro uh, finals and uh, the current um, COVID laboratory. They seem determined to have a laboratory in which they just um, cook up all sorts of the, the new variants of the future which are going to affect us all. So, of course, I'm furious, as usual, about Britain. It seems irredeemable, really. It seems like there's some national fault in the British, um, and particularly, I have to say, in the English, um, of individualism plus kind of hooliganism, Football always seems to be involved somehow, uh, although football in some ways, you know, it's a, a, a model of racial integration, <laughs> football team, whatever. Thank God they didn't win. I was very relieved that they didn't win because um, it just would have um, somehow given some legitimacy to, to Brexit and to Boris Johnson and all the rest of it. Anyway, this might be, it might be the last um, video from Berlin because I have a tendency, you know, the... I think I've spoken about this before um, in terms of when I was living in Osaka. I had an end of history feeling. I really thought that I'd reached, because I because my life was sort of as I wanted it to be in about 2015 onwards. Uh, I was living between Europe and, and Japan uh, in a way that, that I was enjoying. Um, I have an instinct that when that kicks in, it's a bit like what happens with cities when they get civilized and they get a bit more expensive and gentrified. You get the right kind of coffee shop moving into your uh, street and then it gets boring. It actually gets boring and you need to go to a kind of more chaotic environment where things are not quite 
fine-tuned to your needs yet. And you have to, it challenges you, it, it challenges your habits. So Athens was a bit like that for me. It was reassuring in many ways because I'd lived there as a child. So I was connected to a particular very significant moment in my life, which is when I turned, you know, 9, 10, 11. Uh, and I was initially going to the British Embassy School in Athens, which I loved and which was very relaxed and cosmopolitan, mixed of girls and boys. I really felt like I fitted into that school. Uh, and then, but then being sent to boarding school in Scotland, which was a, a completely the opposite, a really dismal, you know, kind of Dickensian experience, like going back to the 19th century, with a lot of values that I rejected all around me. But then, you know, discovering essentially glam rock and David Bowie as a kind of little micro niche within that world, where there was one room in the boarding school where I could go up to the top of the the senior common room in the top of the boarding school house and um, listen to David Bowie records. So that, that bubble of freedom and oxygen allowed me to escape. So being in Athens connected me to that period of my life because I would fly back from boarding school. The British Council would pay for me to fly back uh, to Athens every holiday, every school holiday. So I got, I got that strong sense of a between life where you could have that kind of hellish... Dickensian ecosystem on one hand and then you could have this kind of progressive, sunny, warm, uh, mixed and, you know, it seemed to me at the time that Athens was uh, was the future. And, it, and in terms of my own life, it was the future because I've sort of sought out those environments where I feel they're very soft environments and they're friendly environments and they're in some ways privileged environments. But when they get too perfect and when they attune too much to my values, I then get a destructive, a creative destruction impulse where I have to smash them up with an axe. And so I'm kind of thinking, like I've already thrown out my magazine stand here, which had all these old, dated, outdated magazines. I don't even know if people even buy magazines anymore. Uh, that whole aspirational kind of thing that magazines had, I don't know if there's any place for that anymore in such a dystopian world. This, this is the, the latest magazine I have, just because I wrote a fiction in this about the German artist uh, Joachim Bandau. Um, I was, they're very kind at Moose, I really like Moose, and they've, they've um, allowed me to write uh, fiction, which is in big uh, Garamond setting of text here, with a fiction in which I insert his sculptures into various already existing narratives, and I had a lot of fun writing that, and that's the kind of art writing I'd love to be doing more of in the future, Moose, Italian, Milan-based um, magazine. You see, I could move to Milan as well. Uh, that, I really am now kind of lusting. I feel that I've done my Berlin period now, and I, there's really very little more I could learn from Berlin or interact with Berlin. I, it would just be a question of, oh, I'm here because I'm here, and I put, I've put down roots because I need to have roots somewhere. Actually, I'm not even sure if I do need roots somewhere, but in order to live without roots, I need to be allowed, are you listening, British government? I need you to recognize <clears throat> that when I have two vaccinations with Moderna from Germany, that I'm probably okay and I'm probably not going to spread or even pick up your horrible new concoctions of the COVID virus. Um, the totem insul should open it, its gates to people who are doubly vaccinated in Europe. Um, that's all I've got to say this time and um, thank you for listening and watching. Open University. 